Hello, I'm A.G. Billig and I welcome you to a new session of the Self-Publishing Mastery Weekly Talks. And today I have the great pleasure of uh, having as a guest Sonny and Todaro. He's a co-founder and president of the Greater Los Angeles Writers Society. And he's also the executive director of West Coast Writers Conferences. So, hello, Tony, and it's great to have you here with us today. How are you? Thank you so much for having me here today. I appreciate it. Well, yeah, I think it's just about the right time because we are uh, we are going to talk about one of the major uh, events for writers. We are talking about the Greater Los Angeles Writers Conference. At the annual, my joke is that I've been a writer ever since my first high school column that I um, put out and I immediately got sent to the principal's office. <laughs> So I got, I've, been, I've been in trouble since Tony. <laughs> I got in trouble since high school, but I've always been a writer of one sort or another. I've been in the music business uh, quite a bit as well, uh, but after the music business, I uh, drifted from sales. Not drifted; it was an intentional uh, reinvention, if you will, from uh, sales into marketing, from marketing into brand identity, strategy, and all the way along, I'm writing. It's uh, last 15 years or so that, um, uh, almost 20 now, that I've uh, gotten into creative writing and um, it started forming this, I got in with some other writers and we formed this little group called the West Side Writers here in Los Angeles. And over a period of time that um, developed into what's become the, the Great Los Angeles Writers Society. So for that I've been programming, oh, 10 workshops a year, special speaker events, bringing in people. And actually, I was kind of goaded into this by somebody saying, you keep doing all this stuff for free. You want to do something where you can make a dollar. So I started looking at doing paid workshops. Uh, the first one I did was a one-day event. Um, my goal was for 100 people, and I ended up with 108. <laughs> okay. So that got me fired up and started. and. Um, Kind of the rest is history. We we started out doing a basic creative writing conference mm -hmm. that was covering all genres. Then over a period of time, we decided to develop, because of the way the, the, the writing industry, the publishing industry has changed, authors now have to do more um, involved in their own marketing, social networking, building a platform. So we developed a second conference called The Digital Author. And all along, gee, we were leaving genre people out. So we developed something called Genre Law, which is a takeoff on Shangri La, which is kind of an oasis for writers or authors. And over the years, we've done uh, murder mysteries, we've done um, memoirs. This past year, we did a very successful one with uh, science fiction, fantasy, um, you name it, anything related to speculative fiction that turned out to be very successful. But every year we come back to June is the Greater Los Angeles Writers Conference. This is going to be our 17th um, event. Wow. Wow, that's, uh, that's impressive. And uh, yeah, that's something not, not to be missed. But we will, we will talk about this uh, in detail a, a, little, a little bit later. So um, you, you mentioned that things have changed and yes, they have changed for authors. There are people saying that there is no better time uh, to be an author than nowadays. What do you, what do you think? Actually, about? that's what my uh, keynote speaker at the conference is gonna be talking about. Um, he's uh, um, coming in from Canada and he's the director of a big company up there, um, uh, Kobo, The Writing Life, and um, former president of Canadian publishers are writing or booksellers. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure offhand. And um, he uh, contends, as many people do, that this is really the best time mm -hmm. for um, people to get involved. Uh, Mark Lefebvre. And um, because of the digital world now becoming affordable and more cost effective for authors, um, and the implosion at the same time of what's been going on in New York, the publishing industry, there used to be 40, 50 major publishers, now there's five. And only one of them's American owned. The others are yeah. European owned. Mm -hmm. um, that um, authors have had to look for other uh, avenues to get their work out. So uh, 
that brought, and at the same time, computers were coming cheaper. It was easier to do word processing. Thank you, Steve Jobs. <laughs> really, thank you very much. And um, and um, uh, I think that um, for starters, there was a lot of opposition to us early on in um, Gloss. I wanted to bring in a gal who was president of iUniverse, Susan Driscoll at the time. And I caught so much flack about bringing in somebody that does self-publishing and how this is going to ruin the world. Mm -hmm. But I could sense what was coming. I could sense with the implosion in New York and probably less titles being published, being harder to get a, an agent, harder to get a deal, that more people were going to be able to go self-publishing and afford self-publishing or hybrid or indie. There's a couple of different ways you can refer to it depending on what the writer is actually doing, that um, I saw it as a real reason to um, make our authors aware of it. Uh, my attitude is that there's no wrong way that's right or wrong mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get published, to get your work out there. I like to present the three or four different ways that you can do it. Matter of fact, uh, we have a white paper from... Um, uh, uh, Oh, gee, I can't your members? I beg your pardon? I mean, you have you have on your on on your website. I mean, the website of the of the of the Writers Association. There are like useful resources out there, and I yes. know some of the members contributed with their own expertise for white papers. Yes, but Keith, uh, Keith O'Gorick, who's the senior vice president of Author Solutions, mm -hmm. they bought iUniverse and Xlibris, and they bought all these companies around the world. Uh, wrote a definitive white paper on the four paths of publishing. He mm -hmm. came out to Los Angeles and spoke on the subject. And so at the conference, we'll be giving out free copies of that white paper as well. Mm -hmm. um, so one of our missions is to offer as many different, an education in as many different ways to publish as possible, whether it's through one of the New York Big Five, through a traditional agent or standing on a street corner with uh, some copies you ran off on, uh, you know, your home, your home printer. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, part of uh, the, the industry's really changed. It's continuing to evolve. Uh, Ebooks became very big for a while. They've kind of faded back. Um, people like me can't quite see it in my studio, but uh, there's probably about 2,000 books in my studio behind me and thousands more upstairs. I like a book. I like the see, feel, touch of a real book. That doesn't mean I don't have a lot of computers, and it doesn't mean I don't do work on computers, but like many people, they have found that the uh, visceral feeling of collecting and uh, reading uh, printed words is still very important, at least to our generations that are alive now. Maybe in the joke is maybe in about 30 years, we'll have a little thumb drive that plugs into our neck, and that's how we get our yeah, everything is possible, right? Right. So, um, education is one of the one of the major things to um, to get for writers who attend usually who who attend writers conferences, and this goes for the conference in June. What are what are the other benefits for authors um, of attending these these events? There's, there's a lot of benefits. Um, it's everything from the, it's education as well as I would say inspiration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't want to scare writers. We want to ed educate them, but realistically put them to work hard to realize that they're going to have to turn out quality work. Right. So we want to inspire them to do that. Uh, both my keynotes this weekend, I said, you can talk about anything you want as long as when the audience leaves, they're inspired to go home and write. Mm -hmm. I know when I heard, um, probably one of my mentors uh, was Ray Bradbury. When I heard him speak at UCLA, at Royce Hall, it was like a rock star appearing. And he got up there and he got me so inspired, I wanted to hear every word he said, but at the same time, I couldn't wait for his speech to end and so I could run home and start mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. So we want everybody to feel very inspired. Um, to that end, we've actually expanded the conferences within the conference. For example, um, we are doing now a late night renegade session where members can, attendees can bring uh, part of their, their manuscript. Mm -hmm. And uh, they can sit around a table and they can kind of do like we do with our critique groups. Gloss runs about 20 critique groups. 
and then get hands-on work on it. Uh, and we're doing that with uh, Robert Yelling in the evening. We just added, it's not even on the website as of today, but it will be later, uh, Art Holcomb, who's a very celebrated Hollywood um, oh, writer, script doctor. Uh, he's worked on shows for decades and decades. He's going to be doing breakfast with Art. Wow. So we'll have something before the conference. We'll have the conference. We'll have something after the conference. And then doing the conference, in addition to it, you know, it's just not education and writing. It's the business of writing, too. Mm -hmm. It's the craft and the business. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about copyrights, trademarks, um, dealing with, um, gee, just all the legal issues that come up. Um, one of our literary agents is also an intellectual property attorney, and he talks about um, how to check your sheets that you get from New York to be sure you're not getting cheated on your royalties. Okay, this is bit Paul. This is Paul. This is Paul S. Levine, yeah. um, who's one of the two top agents in Southern California, intellectual property attorney and literary agent. So we try and cover a lot of those kinds of things. In addition to that, we will have editors there that for a small fee, attendees can send in their uh, work ahead of time, a, a sample chapter or two. And for a small fee, they will edit that, meet with the attendee at the conference so that um, they can get hands on first um, real intelligent, professional, courteous, respectful, that's the word I was looking for, critique of their work. Plus we will have literary agents there. You really can't, it's very hard to pitch an agent nowadays. It's hard to send out a query letter. They get hundreds and hundreds a day and it's almost impossible to go through. So the main way that agents find new clients now is at conferences. So they go to the conferences expecting to take pitches. So we not only do pitch sessions, we allow, um, again, for a fee, because the agent charges, to pre-read. The agent will pre-read some of the materials. So by the time the agent meets with the author there, he can talk and tell Jim about, well, here's your story. Here's your plot line. Here's what looks good. Um, here's where you need work. And sometimes the agent will say, I want to see the whole thing. Send me the rest. Oh yeah, that's what we need. Oh, that's what we want to hear. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And as a matter of fact, over the last year, we've had more and more uh, attendees who've gotten um, mm -hmm. agents. Mm -hmm. We have one uh, science fiction agent who says she's gotten more of her clients from our conferences now because of the quality of the attendee and the quality of the work than she does anywhere else. We have another um, attendee who ended up with an agent who sold her concept to New York, got a three book deal, six figure three book deal. And so I'm just a cloud nine about that. Yeah, and you see why I, 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 I uh, like right now, I'm, I'm every day working on my novel because I need to have it finished by, <laughs> by June 18th. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, um, we uh, do things year round. Uh, last month, I ran a panel on, um, I do a couple of literary agent panels a year. Uh, I'm not going to say they're all drinking buddies, but I am friends with about 35, 40 agents. And they like speaking at our events. We have a couple we bring in from uh, San Francisco and San Diego and different parts of uh, the world. We have one coming in from New York and um, to uh, take pitches. So. We try and do it at least two, three times a year. It'll give you the opportunity. Um, I, if I could take a second to talk about our fall event, which is called The Digital Author, which is going to talk about digital publishing, ebooks, a books. I call it ebooks, a books, and p books, which is ebooks, electronic books, a books, uh, which is audio books, which is a, a, a good, um, mm -hmm. small, but a profitable segment yes. for writers. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, p books, which is print on demand books. Yeah. And even with that, we will have alongside that um, a creative writing track called BCX, which is Boot Camp Extreme. And that'll be hard creative writing, and we'll have literary agents there for that. And they'll be taking pitches too. So um, the more people we can get, more authors we can get agents and can get book deals, the happier I am. How did the Greater Los Angeles Writers Conference change over, over the years? So, wow, that's a good question. Um, I would say that 
Uh, how has it changed? I would say it's evolved. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, better evolved. Yeah. The way it's evolved is, um, I mean, it, it's behind the scenes. It's changed in that logistically, we're very sharp. We have a dedicated staff. Mm -hmm. Their number one job is to be sure that every attendee has a great time. We have VIP um, liaisons that their job is just to take our guests of honor around, be sure that anything that they want and need, we have a green room for them. But our attendees, um, we're always looking to be sure our attendees are happy and taken care of. Uh, one of the first things, I've, whatever business I've had, I went out and bought a bunch of walkie talkies. So we could instantly be in communication if somebody needed something or somebody couldn't find something rather than you go to a number of these events and people walk around and say, well, I don't know. Yeah. And, and you walk up to, I remember one of the earliest conferences I went to, I walked up to the counter and I was all excited and I was ready for the weekend. And I says, okay, and I'm ready to go. And the guy behind the counter was, oh, in the mumble, 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 computer doesn't work. And I had to get up too early. And, you don't want to come out for a weekend, spend $300 or $500 and run into a grouch behind the desk. Right. So we want people that are going to be helpful and friendly. We spend a lot of time working on hospitality. So behind the scenes, there's things you see and don't see um, that we get high marks for having a well-oiled conference, if, if you would um, allow me to put it that way. As far as the evolution of the conference, because we've done so many, I've got about 250, almost 300 speakers now, and we run 30 to 40 topics each time. You figure 30, 40 times, gee, we've probably done 450, have I done that many, gee, that many sessions, workshops, we are able to look at, through surveys, what the attendees liked, mm -hmm. what they wanted to learn more about, and fine tune each one after that. Um, sometimes we repeat a topic every time, so, uh, but we use different people on it. So people that come back and somebody might say, well, you know, I heard that topic before, I don't need to hear it again. Well, there's different people talking on it. Mm -hmm. It might be things like, um, gee, things I wish a pro had told me when I first started writing. And they can hear it from best selling authors, things that if they had learned that earlier, would have saved them a lot of time and grief. And uh, marketing, plotting and pacing, a lot of those things, they're really staples that need to be done. Um, and the way I focus it is different than some other conferences. I will never put another group or conference down. They all have their own methodology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, I kind of have a plan. It's like putting together an orchestra. You have to have a certain amount of trumpets and a certain amount of clarinets and a certain yeah. amount of percussion and put it together so you have something that's harmonious. And you want it so that the attendees will get the greatest amount of, out of it as possible. So for every person that I have, every speaker that I have, I probably have two or three people that pitch me, email me, call me that want to appear. The question is, can they contribute to that particular topic? Can they contribute? Are they the best possible person I can get for that conference? Uh, and I regretfully have to turn a lot of people down, and they're, they're you know, they they don't necessarily get pissed at me. Some of them go, "Well, you know, I, I knew this, and I'm really big on that." And hey, you're great. Yeah, I can use you in the future, but I can't use you on this one because we're not talking about it this time. So to me, it's very important that the topics are appropriate. And then what I do, last but to make a, a long story not too long. Um, I string them together from beginning to end. So over the course of the weekend, you start off with things like, where, where do great ideas come from? Mm -hmm. um, I have a great idea, now what? Character building, plotting and pacing, all the basics. Right. Then we'll get into uh, developing your work, overcoming uh, writer's block, is a writer's block. Yeah, that's, I um, wanted to ask you, so do you, believe, do you believe in the writer's block, but yeah. Well, I don't. I don't, because you never get it, right? I, well, no, yes, I do. I call it projectus interruptus. <laughs> and uh, that's a made-up Latin word. And uh, so what I do is the same as, um, I was on a panel with uh, some very wonderful people. Um, Diana Glyer, who wrote the book, The Company They Keep, the story of the first critique group ever, which was J.R.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, 
Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Tim Powers, who's a number of terrific books. Uh, one of his uh, more recent pieces, uh, On Stranger Tides, became one of the Pirates of the Caribbean. He's a terrific writer and an educator. And what we discovered to do is when you run up to a part of your story that you're not ready to write, it's not writer's block, it's projectus interruptus. So we just put something big in line, in caps, in brackets. We need to fix this later. Okay, and you, and you, and you. And then I go on mm -hmm. to something else, to some other part of the book that I can write. And then I realize that I may have to go back and put these pieces together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So someone, someone who says they have writer's block and they can't write, um, they're in denial. You know, either they're not really a writer or they're not thinking in terms of what's the big story, what's the story you want to tell. Right. And to someone like that, I tell them what I do. I, I have a synopsis before I start, but I write the first chapter, I write the last chapter. Mm -hmm. Then I just have to fill in the 100,000 words in the middle. Okay. So to that end, I don't get writer's block because I kind of knowing um, where I'm going, um, trying to think of this um, inspirational speaker. He says, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I avoid that for the most part. Authors years ago could write any length. Mm -hmm. They really could. Um, books like J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings would have a terrible time trying to get published today because off, uh, publishers want 80,000 words that they can put in a little package and put X amount of them in a box mm -hmm. that they can send off for the least amount of postage. Okay. So epic novels are very hard to sell. And most agents, when they ask, how long is your work? If someone says, well, it's 120 or 150 or 200,000 words. I'm going to say. Warning, warning. So unless it's fantasy, which can go a little longer. Mm -hmm. My science fiction uh, novels run 90, 95,000 words. My fantasy will run 110, 106,000 words. You can get away with a little more in a fantasy novel. But when somebody, somebody right now on Facebook is saying, woohoo, I reached 220,000 words. And I sent her a little private message saying, I think you've got two books there, or maybe yeah. three. Uh huh. Yeah. Assume so it. nowadays you can't write epics the way once unless you become a best-selling author. If you become, um, geez, I, I can name fifty, um, then you can write any length you want. Then you can get away with it. But by the time you become that best-selling, you've got a publishing contract, and your publisher wants X amount of books a year. So they still don't want less than eighty to ninety thousand words, because they want to see two, not one book a year out of you. They want to see two. Right. So that's a different kind of problem. So it's, it's, it's um, the um, Neil, uh, well, I feel like an idiot. I can't think of this guy's last name, uh, that writes uh, very long books. But he can get away with 1,000-page books uh, that are just wonderful works of art um, that the average author just plain can't get away with. Because this guy's got a track record. You, you mean the British guy? No. Uh, what's his last name? Well, I'm thinking of uh, Neil Gaiman, but he's the Neil, Ga Neil Gaiman is uh, also in that um, league, but I'm, I'm actually thinking of someone else. Neil Gaiman is a terrific writer as well. Yeah. Uh, he's agreed to come out and speak. Um, once I hold an event in Hawaii. Oh, wow. He said, if you hold it in Hawaii, I will come. Great. So and uh, so he's on our hit list for our... Um, Next year, uh, maybe? I beg pardon? Next year, maybe? Oh, I wish. I wish. It, it's simply a matter of uh, 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 timing. But we want to do some events over there. We're, 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 we've expanded out from Los Angeles. We do events in the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, we do events. So we have events planned in San Diego. We're working on some writers' retreats in uh, Rosarita Beach, uh, some other places that I don't want to mention. But I'm from Hawaii originally. I'm an Italian from Pennsylvania that was brought up in Hawaii. So at one point I had island fever and I had to get out. Now it's the opposite. Now I want to go back. <laughs> well, that's, that's understandable. I mean, who wouldn't want to go back? Um, uh, I can't, well, I'm glad some people don't. So that leaves a little more room for, for me and my friends. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to the Greater Los Angeles Writers Conference. Yes. 
so book marketing is, is one of the is one of the one, one of the topics uh, you, uh, you are going to cover at the conference and i know that book marketing is a pet peeve for many authors uh what suggestions do you have for for them you know to help them enjoy actually uh doing well, this marketing their books um let me explain what the problem is first uh, you're not gonna like the answer to the question but uh let me explain what the problem is authors want to be authors they don't want to get out and market they want to sit and write their work and as much over the years as my background is advertising and marketing and brand building mm -hmm. when i'm in a writing mode i don't want to get out and market and do book appearances and yeah. things that i just want to write so it's a matter of authors now have to understand, most do, some never will, that the, whether you're self-publishing or you're through New York, the publishers count on you getting out and having a platform and getting out and making appearances, going to bookstores, going to things like events like Los Angeles Times Festival of Books, WonderCon, um, the Bay Area Festival of Books, Tucson, as many book fairs and events as you can go to, to, uh, you know, the opening of a 7-Eleven that has a bookshelf, you want to be there. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for uh, some authors to get in that mindset altogether. Um, how do they fix that? I can only answer your question this way and say, come to the conference. Okay. Hear from the experts who deal with this on a regular basis, people like uh, Desiree Duffy, Mm -hmm. will be there. Uh, we're doing a terrific one on uh, Sunday, traditional publishing versus self-publishing versus hybrid publishing, which way should you go? Uh, one gal there, Nora Flight, has written dozens of books. She's mispromotion. Uh, social net, we'll be talking social networking. Uh, Sarah Howery Hart will be talking about no budget, no PR budget, no problem. So she's got ways to do advertising and marketing for free. That's good news, yeah. Yes. And, um, and uh, marketing yourself in the 21st century, which you're on, and you'll yeah. be uh, moderating that panel there with, uh, um, gee, some terrific uh, people that are serious promoters, as good a writer as they are. They are willing to get out there and paint their hair pink and stand out in front of a booth all day and... and build that rapport with their, their readership. Um, but it, it's not an easy task, it's, it really isn't. Yeah, but uh, people should know, and other authors should know that even if they have the money to hire a, a book publicist, they still need to do, they still need to get involved in these book marketing things. Well, a good publicist is gonna get them out there. Mm -hmm. It's gonna say, you gotta go here, you gotta go here. Mm -hmm. uh, I set you up with a, a bookstore signing. Yeah. Uh, there's some publicists that that's what they do. They, they charge for it, but they will call the bookstores and they say, hey, I've got so-and-so coming through your area. Can you give them, when can you give them two hours or four hours or a half day? What advertising can we help do? And they will help plan some of these kinds of things. Now, without mentioning names, um, I have one very famous author. I phone, talk, spoke with him by phone in the last couple of weeks and I said, when are you coming out to LA again? He says, I'm not. I says, not for a while. I said, what's the matter? I says, you have a major publisher. You've written 30, 40 books. He says, my, my publisher won't give me a, a book tour money right now. I says, you got to be kidding. And he says, no. He says, if you want to fly me out, I'm interested. He says, right now, um, I'm only touring within 100 miles of my home okay. because I can't get money for hotels and airfare. So it's, it's made a little, been made a little bit more difficult by some of the publishers that are not supporting. They'll support a, support a New York Times bestselling author sometimes first over a new one coming up. They want to put their money with what they think is a sure thing. It's a smart publisher that sees the market potential and will put some advertising money, some marketing money into uh, reviews and ads in some of the magazines to um, uh, and help get them in Barnes and Nobles and some of the book sellers uh, to put a face to the author so that the author can help build their list. And, and I always tell authors when they get out there, just one more point on this, 
just don't go and say hi and smile and hold your book up. Have bookmarks, have uh, a guest book, and get names, get emails, build your list. Mm -hmm. You've got to do that. You have to build a network of fans. You have to build your fan base so that every time you go somewhere, you can email and you talk to them. I have one gal a couple of years ago at Festival of Books. Uh, she brought one of her daughters along. The daughter stood out front and passed off bookmarks. So um, mom sold about 40 books. The daughter passed out maybe 2,000 bookmarks. Okay. Over the next six months, she sold another 300 books. Oh, that's not Where people, they didn't buy at the time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they went online, they saw the website, and they ordered online, or I call it eating beans and planting beans. Your eating beans are the books you sell now. Your planting beans are those things that you sow for future sales. Great, great idea. And that's why it's, it, it is so important, especially for others who are choosing to self-publish their book, to uh, think business and to wear this business hat because otherwise they will end up with the book you know on amazon and ranking like at the end of it. yeah yeah or they'll end up they'll, they'll make the bad mistake and get too many copies printed they'll do some self-publishing overprint and end up with a garage full of books yeah and there's your cash flow right there that they need for advertising so that's a talent all on its own is how many books can it if you're gonna self-publish, you have to realize you're in business for yourself. So therefore, it's how many books do I buy? Who, how am I gonna promote? Where am I gonna promote? How much money am I putting into inventory and marketing versus how much time am I putting into writing the next book? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And being really like really productive and really good with your, with your time, like getting everything done by the clock and uh, having like a schedule because otherwise you will end up with doing nothing. Yeah, <laughs> I would say sometimes I'm a bit guilty there too. <laughs> we, all, we all are, I think. It's, it's one of these, sometimes the, the joke is if you see an author sitting in a corner looking at the wall, it doesn't mean he or she aren't doing anything. It may be that they're thinking about what they're gonna write about next. But that time of inactivity has to account creatively. Mm -hmm. It has to account for something somewhere along the line. Yeah, yeah, true. So you've, you, you've met all these experts and all these people and all these authors. And um, from this perspective and being like in the, in, the indus in the industry for so many years, how do you, how do you think self-publishing will change, evolve in the next few years? Is it, here, is it here to stay? Self-publishing is never going to go away. Mm -hmm. Now that computers are cheap, affordable, uh, on-demand printing is cheap, affordable, uh, the internet is made um, the planet smaller, uh, it's going to be finding more ways to uh, expedite delivery. Mm -hmm. For example, there are some bookstores now and I know Barnes & Noble's experimenting with this as well, where they have, they're called Gutenbergs, and it's a digital press on premises. So you can walk around, see book fronts, you take it to the desk, and they say that'll be 20 bucks for a soft cover or 30 bucks for a hard cover or whatever. And you go have a cup of coffee in the restaurant at the bookstore, and you come back a half an hour later, and they've printed one out for you. So there's the possibility, the potential to deliver books, hard covers, soft covers, just physical books uh, in, a, in a more timely manner. We've all become interested in instant gratification. Sure. When Amazon came up with two day delivery, the world went nuts. Now Amazon is even opening some stores around the country. Mm -hmm. here, they, here they close so many stores because they, they of all of their email, of all of the um, direct delivery over the internet, right. Now they're opening stores because guess what? They've got returns. They've got inventory. They don't want to spend any more on freight, so they want to deliver it to the closest distribution center, if you will. So they've started opening physical locations, Portland, I think Seattle, definitely New York, um, so that it, it, the cycle is kind of coming around a little bit. But self-publishing is versus – Self-publishing versus traditional publishing, 
um, is, is been time sensitive and budget sensitive. So if, if somebody can get some instant gratification on uh, delivery with a uh, book by a smaller or an indie publisher, that is going to make a big difference too. And I think continuing growth of audiobooks, because in Los Angeles, everybody's in a car. Right. Everybody's driving or stuck in traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, you may only have, uh, if I go from here to UCLA, or uh, yeah, UCLA, that's 14 miles. If I go from Redondo Beach to UCLA, and I can do it maybe half an hour. If I go that same 14 miles down to Orange County, it can take me an hour and a half, two hours. Oh, yeah. Well, it depends the time where you're going, but yeah, 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 that's true. And that's all because of traffic. So what do you do during that time? How many times can you listen to the same rock and roll song over and over or whatever your preference is on the radio? So I listen to audio books. I listen to educational books. And um, so it's, it's, it's not a big percentage when you look at the billions of dollars in books. I don't know, it's three to five percent of the market, but three to five percent is still a good chunk of change if you can sell enough audiobooks. So these kinds of uh, things for gratification or um, Walmart now is doing a, um, you can order something online and then pick it up at a local store. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, rather than delivering it to your home, yada, yada, and having a freight charge, you get it free if you'll pick it up at a Walmart. So sometimes if I have something I really need, Walmart's got a good price on it, like I bought a projection screen. It was easier for me to order it online and drive one mile and pick it up a day later rather than waiting for it to come and paying a lot of freight to have it that way. So Walmart's kind of tuned into it as well, too. The biggest book retailers now is not Barnes & Noble. It's Walmart, yeah. Target. And Costco. I remember, yeah, so maybe why not have a book launch at, in, at Costco, you know? I would, I would kill to do that. I would love to Walmart, do that. Yeah. We could be right between the, the little, uh, uh, I don't know if it was the last time you were in there, but um, I'm, I'm there at least once, a couple times a month. I, I was there last week, so I don't know, about in the garden department or? Uh... Well, between each of the uh, food aisles, you know, they're selling samples on the end. Yeah. yeah. I'll, you know, try this and try that. Yeah, yeah. All these little samples of food and drink. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have some people there just to be, here, would you like to hear something from my book? Yeah. You know, they could just stand there at a little podium and, uh, uh, and, and my book's stacked up right behind me. I, I think they could do it. Wow, we should, ask, we should ask the people from, from Costco. Maybe you can offer it as a, you know, like an, an incentive for the members of the Greater Los Angeles Writers Society, you know? It would be nice. Uh, I, I would be game to do that. Uh, we have done several um, book weekends at Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm. and they've been very successful. They're hard to arrange. We've done The Grove, which is the biggest bookstore on the West Coast. We've done uh, Long Beach. Uh, but uh, we've taken 10 authors a day for two days over a weekend. And it went very well, but it's a lot of work to put one of those on. And it's a volunteer organization, so I need to get more volunteers to help me <laughs> wrangle something like this together. Okay, so the call is out there. So people who, who watch us, if they want to help, I think you you will welcome them. We need you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so the Greater Los Angeles Writers Conference coming soon, June 16th, right? June 16th, 17th, and 18th. It's a solid three days. Some, again, some conferences, all they have on Friday is they get you there, they sign you up, they have a cocktail party, and they're done. Yeah, true. I've got 12 to 14 workshops on Friday, okay, plus a networking party afterwards. We will do that. So we believe in giving our attendees, um, my phrase is I like to under-promise and over-deliver. Yeah, good one. So we give them a full weekend. Mm-hmm. So any tips and tricks uh, for those who will attend on how they can make the, mes the most out of this, uh, this year? Uh, there are many. Um, bring lots of paper. We supply the pens. Attend as many of the workshops as you can. Uh, you can don't, don't sleep. Don't take a break. <laughs> you can sleep Monday or when you're dead. Or, but, or Thursday. Have a good night on Thursday night. Yeah. Okay. Get an extra good night's sleep on Thursday because we're going to work you hard over the course of the weekend. We don't have big breaks between sessions. We give you enough time to get from one room to the next or take a quick restroom break. 
I, 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 <laughs> I did a whole extra track a day more than most events do because of how I, I run it. Um, and um, just be prepared to learn as much as you can, network with other authors um, during down times in the evening, lunch, dinner, and um, then don't make any decisions until afterwards. Take the week after, let everything sink in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then find what works for you. If you, if you hear, um, the worst thing I could ever do is have a panel that everybody agrees. I like it when they argue on a panel, because that means the audience is getting different points of view. Yeah, that's true. So I want everybody to be, make up their own mind on a particular topic, what works best for them. So that's what I want people to come and look for, not just to get an education. It's not dry cut. It's, well, not only what should I do, but when should I do it and why should I do it? Mm -hmm. Or maybe I shouldn't do it at all. So there's a, there's a lot of depth in, in what we do, and that's why I have uh, one gal now that uh, this is going to be her 10th conference. Okay, where can we uh, register for the conference? They can go, anybody can go to uh, internet to uh, www dot w c writers dot com that's w c w r i t e r s dot com uh there's all our conferences are there but that link will automatically go to whatever the latest conference is mm -hmm. it will take them an overview of the conference it'll take them they can see every topic who's speaking the bios on them they can see all the agents all the editors maps we have more maps than anybody else how to get there where to park we we every question that somebody can probably ask we have answered on that website worst case scenario if you're just plain not um literate with the internet uh and i know people that aren't you can simply call us locally here in los angeles in the 310 area code 310 379 2650 it's 310 379 2650 we can take all your information on the phone. Great. Thank you so much, Tony. I'll see you in June, June 16th, at the Greater Los Angeles Writers Conference. Thank you.